Point of truth, all right, uh, raise your hand. If you're at home, you can raise your hand by yourself, all right? Uh, if you struggle maybe with forgiving other people, all right? I see a lot of hands here in St. Charles. Raise your hand if you struggle with forgiving yourself. Even more hands. I, I mean, isn't that the truth? I mean, this is a place where we can be transparent and honest. I mean, my hand was up high as well. I mean, it's true. We, we have a tough time learning how to forgive, and yet oftentimes we struggle even more with forgiving ourselves. After all, we do become our own worst enemy, right? We know our own shortcomings. We know our own pitfalls. We know what we have done. We know the potential that we can do with our words, with our hands, with our behaviors, with our actions. And, and what happens is that we carry them around. And then they spill into all of our relationships. We've been in this series called Relation Slips and looking at different areas where our relationships have slips, ships, have slipped up. <laughs> Don't say that too fast, right? <laughs> I have three more weeks of this. <laughs> but, but when we look at the story of the two sons and their father, what we discover is that it's all about relationships. Between the younger brother and the father, between the older brother and the father, which we'll talk about here in a few weeks, between the brothers themselves, and if we look at the beginning of this passage back in chapter 15, the very first verse, you have all these people listening in. We have tax collectors and sinners, folks who were not considered to be church folks, who didn't belong in the church, who, whose reputation, whose resume didn't add up. And then you had all the really goody two-shoe, we know the types, right? Perfect attendance award type people. Uh, they called them Pharisees and teachers of the law. And, and they were the ones who said, well, you're either in or you're out. And, and so Jesus has all these people gathered around as he shares this story. And, and as we've been looking at these different relationships, we've discovered really uh, our relationships, how they go, either bring family together, people together, or they separate, they break people apart. And then last week, we, we really wrestled with, with what it meant to feel worthy or lovable, and, and we see that the younger brother, as he comes back, and we're going to dig into this even more here this week, uh, as he comes back, it wasn't his, his great plan, it wasn't his performance, but rather it was something altogether different. It was the love of the Father that kept everything together. So, so here, here's one of the things that we learn here from this section of the story, okay? You can jot it down if you want. Um, we, we provide some space in your worship folder for some worship notes. Uh, feel free to go off, off uh, the questions there, or you can just jot it down and make a note yourself, all right? The first thing we discover is this forgiveness is assertive. Okay, everybody say assertive with me. Assertive. And, and we, we could think of that as aggressive. It, this is what I mean by it. Forgiveness always takes the first step. All right, and that might be kind of countercultural, counterintuitive, because we oftentimes think of forgiveness as something that is earned or something that might be needing to be deserved or at least given only when somebody admits to something is wrong. So they have to come back to you and, and kind of lay it out, and then you can offer forgiveness. And this is just kind of how we're trained, how we're conditioned, uh, not just as Americans, but American Christians even. And so I, I think Jesus here has something to teach us. Because notice the father here doesn't wait around for the younger son. Did you notice this? He doesn't wait around for the younger son to come back and to beg him for mercy, to beg him for grace, to forgive him only on the conditions if he would actually demonstrate a life change. He was, the father wasn't sitting around thinking, gosh, what, what, what a jerk he was for robbing me, for stealing me, not just of money, but of my reputation. And it was something altogether different. He rather ran out to his son before his son could even get out a word of admission, a word of confession, a word of anything. The forgiveness of the father was assertive and that assertiveness drove him out to embrace him and kiss him while he was still a long way off. He might not think that's so important, but check out what the Gospel of Mark said. Jesus said these words. Let's read it together. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And maybe you're new to church, maybe, maybe you're just getting back in the church, and you hear those words, it's like, wow, that's really convicting. And it's meant to be. Uh, this is one of the tougher sayings of Jesus on forgiveness. And, and what really what he's saying is what you do here in a religious setting, whether it's going to church or in your Bible study or whatever, uh, it's not as important as actually living out 
what Jesus has already given to you, namely the forgiveness and love that he's given to you. And so he's saying before you even, even come to church, before you even pick up a Bible, before you do anything, what? Forgive others so that your Father in heaven, what? May forgive you your sins. This is one of those really interesting passages where, where Jesus kind of puts a condition on forgiveness, saying that you will forgive as you forgive others. We say that in the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those, let's finish it, who trespass against us. So it's kind of like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. It's kind of this reciprocal thing. But Jesus is here teaching a fundamental truth about forgiveness, that the ability for us to forgive others, or at least begin to move toward forgiving others, is directly dependent on how we ourselves understand how we have been forgiven. So that's the first thing that, that we find here. We can go to other passages like Matthew 18. This is how serious Jesus takes this. All right? He says, if, you, if your brother sins against you, go show him his fault just between the two of you. So don't bring in a, another party. Don't go around gossip about folks. Don't post it on Facebook or Twitter. All right? Don't Snapchat it to anybody. Uh, go and just between you two, work it out. Make the wrong things right the right thing to do. And then he says this, if he listens to you, what happens? You have won your brother over. Now, notice that that he didn't say, well, if everything kind of smooths over, uh, if he agrees with you, um, if you guys all become friends and and all get together again, and it's just like before, no, he doesn't say that because he knows that, that That if you're going to seek out forgiveness, there's probably a wrong that had been committed against one or the other, or really both uh, against each other, and that doesn't mean that things stay the same. That's another sermon. But he does say, Jesus says, if he listens to you, if he receives it, if he's convicted saying, yeah, uh, you're right, what happens? You have won your brother over. And we could say sisters too. It's not just guys, it's girls as well. Matthew chapter 5, we're told this, therefore, if you, if you have an offering, if you bring your offering, your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. In other words, uh, uh, God, God's saying, you know, this is all good. <laughs> But go reconcile, go, go, go and live at peace. As far as it's with you, live at peace with one another before you even come into a, a place like this in a very literal sort of way because your life is going to speak volumes more than whether or not you come to a church service, whether you read your Bible every day. All those are good and they shape and form our hearts, but what Jesus is saying here is your life will demonstrate the fruit of faith that he has placed in you. You follow that? Um, and, and these are really tough tough verses to wrestle with as we get into the story here today. And and they're tough because I I believe, and I'm guilty of this too, we don't live like this, do we? Oftentimes we we try to avoid conflict situations. Anybody conflict avoidant? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Um, But but most of us, we like playing the blame game, don't we? It's kind of like two-year-olds on the playground. He did it. She pushed him first. If you knew what he said to me before I said it to him, I mean, we, we've played this game before, right? We play it in our marriages, in our relationships, in our homes, with our kids, with our brothers and sisters. We even play it in the church. Let's be honest. We play it in the church. And yet Jesus here through this story is giving us a different picture. He's saying it doesn't have to be like that. Because truth be told, you and I, we feel awful when we play the blame game, do we not? You walk away from the blame game feeling horrible. You feel like, like you've betrayed yourself, maybe. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it's tough for us to forgive ourselves is because we know what we did, and we feel it. That's why we, we are encouraged by Jesus to receive the love of the Father here. So, so that's the first thing we learn is forgiveness takes the initiative. See, the father, he didn't wait around for the son to come back. He didn't ask for him to beg his way back. Rather, he just goes and takes the first step. He runs out, clobbers him, bear claws him, and embraces him and kisses him. The second thing that we discover is that forgiveness is sacrificial, all right? Sacrificial. Everybody say that word with me. 
sacrificial. And, and it's true, the younger son has hurt the father. I think we would agree with that. The younger son has hurt the father in a very deep way. Two ways specifically that we can pull out. One is financially. We know that the younger son, when he asked for his inheritance, he asked for a third of the property. That'd be like, like your son, your daughter, your next of kin, asking you for a third of your net worth. For many of you, it's probably in the millions of dollars. It's just true. I mean, just putting it in real, real world terms. Millions of dollars. Now, if that happened to you, would you be ticked? Yeah. Would you be hurt? Yeah. I know I would be. And I'm a pastor. But notice who absorbs the debt. Notice who pays it back. The younger brother, he goes back thinking, gosh, uh, my father has everything. He has more than enough stuff. better? All right. Uh, he, he has this plan. Uh, if I could just be like one of the hired servants, then, then I can have a roof over my head, I have food in my belly, and, and then eventually as a hired servant, he doesn't even have to pay me, then I can repay him. You see how, how, how he's thinking? And so, so the younger brother, he comes back, and he's thinking he's going to repay the debt. And yet the father, he, he absorbs the debt. He says, no, you're not even going to pay, pay back a penny of it. Instead, I'm going to come out to you. I'm going to be assertive. I'm going to take the first step out to you. I'm going to embrace you. I'm going to love you. And not only that, I'm going to give you the robe, which means now you're part of the family again. I'm going to give you the ring, which means now you can sign contracts on behalf of the family. So not only are you part of the family again, now you are actually a worker in the family at a C-level position, all right, a, a, a sort of a chief executive officer position. And I'm going to feast you like one that I would be sending off with a new bride. So the father does all that. And so he absorbs the debt. He cancels the debt that the younger son gave to him financially. But there's also a social debt that he cancels out as well. You can imagine all the voices, all the community buzzing about this because it would be very shameful for a younger son especially, but for any son to wish his father dead. And then it would be equally as shameful for the father to give in to the son without beating him. And notice the father doesn't do any of that. The father in, in, instead, he goes and absorbs the social debt, the social fallout, the reputation that has been harmed, the Facebook image that has been tainted, the Snapchats and texts that have been sent around that are just false. He says, I can take it because you're my son. You see, this absorption of the debt, the father will not allow the younger brother to pay back anything. And so if you have your Bibles open, go down with me to verse 20, and we're going to see it just firsthand, how the father welcomes his son so the son arose and came to the father, and while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt what? Compassion, and ran and embraced and kissed him. So he runs. The superior man would remain stationary, stoic, kind of like Germans, right? Just kind of, hmm. But instead, he drops everything. He sets his pride aside. He knows that he was in the right. He knows that he did nothing wrong. And yet he sets all that aside to bring his younger son back. Incredible. Incredible. The father doesn't stand on his status. He doesn't stand on his pride. He doesn't stand on the record of even his, his good work of giving in to the son for keeping the family together. But not only does he not allow the son to pay back the social debt, he won't allow him to pay back the financial debt. He won't even let him work for him. Now, here, here comes the question. We get that picture. What would it take for the community of God, the family of God, to live forgiveness like that? That's very different than playing the name game or the blame game, right? It's very different than trying to get even. 
It's very different than, than trying to hold a, a power play or, or engage in a power struggle of who's right and who's wrong. And at the end of the day, we have to pause as Jesus is teaching not just the folks around him in this story, but he teaches us about what forgiveness really is. You see, the story isn't primarily just about, about a, a fable about two sons and their father. Rather, he's teaching us a spiritual principle. That's what a parable is, a spiritual story um, that is meant for a spiritual purpose, and, and he makes forgiveness real. Because put yourself in the, in the place of those who are listening in. The sinners and tax collectors, they're expecting uh, the younger brother just to get a wailing. And, and think about it like this. If you were the father and you saw the son who took a third of everything you had, what would you expect him, if you see him coming back, what would you be expecting him to ask you? For more money. That's right, for more money. So that's what the tax collectors and sinners, they were expecting. And yet the the church folks, the Pharisees and tax collect, or, uh, and teachers of the law, they're, they're just waiting. They're like, oh, he's going to let them have it. This is going to be good. And both of them were wrong because of the love of the Father. Now, what, what's driving that? What's driving that? Take a look down, verse 20 again. While he was still a long way off, the Father saw him and felt what again? Compassion compassion. That, a simple way of thinking of compassion is this, to be moved from the depths of your very being to love somebody. That's what compassion is, to be moved from the very depths of your being to love somebody. It's similar to the feeling that you might have about a child. It's a, similar to the feeling that you might have as you're passing a really bad car crash. It's like, oh, it's that gut-wrenching experience. You know what I'm talking about? And whenever we see the word compassion, we have to remind ourselves that this is Jesus' signature word. It's a signature word that explains who God is and makes God real. You see, compassion is, is what drives the Father to take the first step. Compassion is what is in the inside of the Father to, to sacrifice, to absorb the death that his younger son has caused. You see, compassion is what drives Jesus to come down, to become a man, to become a human being for you and for me, and to sacrifice himself to absorb your debt and mine, to take the first step that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. While we were still a long way off, Jesus comes to us. While we were still uh, conflict avoidance and resisting taking the first steps in forgiveness in our own relationships, Jesus comes and reminds us that we indeed are already forgiven before we can even say a word. You see, compassion of the Father is revealed when the Father doesn't stay on the porch, when he runs to his son. And by doing so, what happens is that the, the Father, he bears his legs. And, and it's not really obvious here in the text, but this is what happens. Uh, when you're running in a robe, gals, ladies, you know what it's like to run in a dress, right? Uh, it's not really comfortable from what I understand. But what, what's happening is that the father is becoming incredibly vulnerable. Not just his status, not just his social reputation, uh, but his emotions become vulnerable. And here, here's where we need to pause because I, I believe a lot of times we, we get stuck in forgiving ourselves and forgiving each other for the same reason. Because it's hard for us to be vulnerable. If we were in a Baptist church, I'd hear an amen or hallelujah. But it's true. I mean, even, even, even as a pastor, I mean, you, you get hurt, right? Uh, you, you get wronged. And, and as we grow older, it gets harder and harder and harder to become vulnerable. And yet God, he demonstrates what vulnerability looks like in a different community, in a different relationship, in a different family. It's a vulnerability that, that isn't on an account of who's right and who's wrong, who has the, the upper hand on an argument. It's not even the, the, the uh, ability to say, well, I was in the right and you were in the wrong. And No, it's not that at all. The vulnerability that's demonstrated in the Father here is simply, it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. The point is, I have loved you and I have embraced you and I have kissed you in my heart from day one. 
we read that, that the father embraced him and kissed him. And we have to ask the question, why did he kiss him? I mean, why, why would Jesus point out that the father kissed him? Which is a very affectionate sort of connection. I mean, we don't just go around kissing anybody, right? At least that's what I tell my kids. It's true. It's because the father in his heart from day one, before he was even born, was kissing him in his heart. And it's the exact same thing God the Father does for you and for me. That before we were even a thought, before we were even born, before we could even utter a word, before we even came into church, before we even committed the thing that we knew we shouldn't have done, the Father was loving us and kissing us and embracing us, which is exactly what came forward. Remember uh, the psalmist says, what is in the heart translates into our actions, right? What's in the heart translates into our actions. And we see it right here with the Father. He's been loving and kissing and embracing the Son from the beginning. Which makes us ask the question, what would it look like for us? Instead of playing the, the blame game, I mean, it's true, when somebody hurts us, where does our minds go? How can I get even? How can I get back? Justice! Equality, right? We're, we're Americans, we understand justice and equality. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Set that aside. I, I, those are good ideals. Those are good things. But let's set it aside because I want to show you a forgiveness. I want to show you a love. I want to show you a way of life that is completely different. And it's one not based on social status or ability to perform, but rather the love that comes from the compassion that God has given to you and to me. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we take baby steps. If anybody's seen the movie, What About Bob? You know what I'm talking about, right? Baby steps. And sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. But remember, the younger son, before he could even get out a word, the father is already on him, loving him, forgiving him, embracing him. I want to check out this, this passage from Romans. It's up on the screen. I'll follow along as I read, all right? You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love, we would say his forgiveness as well, for us in this. Let's read it together. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still far away, while we were still unable to forgive, while we were still working out our own stuff, while we were still not vulnerable enough to even to be honest with ourselves, while we know that we are not there yet, what? Christ died for us. And that's the whole point of what, why Jesus is highlighting this in the story because for, for those who feel outside of, of the love of God, who feel unworthy, who feel unlovable, who beat themselves up, who can't come to the point of forgiving themselves, the truth is that Jesus still loves you. He still embraces you. He's still kissing you in his heart. And he is waiting for the day. He is waiting because he has died for you. And yet, for those who think we have it all together, who might be prideful or self-righteous, who are just waiting for the Father to, to go get them. You too, while you were still far away, while you were still stuck in your pride, while you are still stuck in your self-righteousness, Jesus died for you too. You see, it's something altogether different. It's the love of God made real in the relationship between the Father and this younger son. St. Teresa of Avila once said, When that happens, the first kiss from the lips of the Lord will make a thousand terrible lives of suffering look like one night in a bad hotel. It'd be easy for me to say, here are the 12 steps for forgiving other people. All right? Some of us, we wish that there was a process like that. Um, it'd be really easy for me to say, hey, here are the three principles, and if you just live out these three principles, then then all your relationships will come into order. I mean, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? But here's what, what this story has taught me and, and what I'm learning as I follow Jesus and what I want to encourage you all in. That it's not a 12-step process. It's not a three-principle way of life. It's not an enlightened path. 
It's simply grabbing hold to the promise that we just heard. That while we were still sinners, while we were still far off, Jesus comes to us, he embraces us, he kisses us because it's what he has been doing the entire time. And that, that if you are, are like me, that you, there's aspects of your life that, that, gosh, man, I just can't forgive myself. May the promise of Jesus work into your heart that you are loved, you are forgiven beyond your wildest imagination, beyond your wildest dreams, and, and may that lift you to the skies. And, and if you're sitting back and saying, wow, you know, uh, I don't really need forgiveness. I mean, I, 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 I'm a pretty good person. May those words bring conviction to you. May, may those words bring a reminder that you once were lost. And while you may have the confidence today that there are still things that God wants to work out in you, and so you're in that same boat while you were still far off, while you don't even know you may still be far off, Jesus is still embracing you and loving you and kissing you and bringing you into his kingdom, into his family. Again, it'd be easy to share the 12 best ways or um, whatever like that. But we know it's a supernatural sort of thing, right? I mean, some of us, I, I, I've heard stories of, of forgiveness, like, I don't even know where that came from. You're talking to, to, to someone, and, and it just kind of comes up, and, and at first it's the awkward silence, and then the words just come out, and it's like, I don't even know where that came from. I'll tell you where it came from. It came from God. Because, you see, that's what happens as these words of God's love and forgiveness work on you. As you rest in his love, as you rest in his embrace, as you rest in his kisses, as you rest in his acceptance and forgiveness yourself, your heart becomes more and more like the Father's. It's just how it works. So that's my prayer for each and every one of us. That our hearts are shaped and formed by the heart of the Father. Let's stand.